This is John Glossarian, and you're listening to Cinepod, the cinematography podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ilya, where the hell are we right now? <laughs> we're inside the Hot Rod Cameras uh, screening room. Yeah, we're both in the same room again. This is like the fourth time in, in almost two years. And, uh, and we're, we're both masked, but like I can see your eyes. <laughs> you can. Oh, man. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not far away from me. We're in the same room. You know, don't have to go through an internet. We don't have to go through a Zoom meeting. We don't have to have any sort of special technology. We're, we're both actually present. It's so weird seeing people in person. So uh, who do we have on the show today? Uh, we have good friend of Hot Red Cameras, John Gulasarian. Awesome. DP of Candyman. Uh, so and, exciting. And, and, many other, and many other movies, uh, including uh, Like Crazy, which is actually how I got to know him. He uh, shot the first ever feature film on one of our modified Canon 7D cameras. And then at Sundance, actually in front of like a huge crowd of people, gave me props and thanked me in front of everyone for like making the film possible, which was like, damn, I was, I was blushing. I couldn't believe Aww. it. So he, he, Anyway, uh, John Gulasarian, super nice guy. Super nice guy. Really fantastically talented and uh, I'm really excited that we finally get to have him on the show because there's a little bit of a backstory like we we had done an interview uh, with John before he was allowed to talk about Candyman and then you uh, had a pickup we had a pickup yeah we had a pickup and uh, I I interviewed him and uh, he was in a different country and and we talked uh, almost exclusively about Candyman so uh, it was very exciting because I um, I I really love his work in the new Candyman movie and was the number one movie in America when it debuted too yeah yeah and and, you know I think that you might hear a little bit of uh, difference in the the uh, background sound maybe between those two interviews but it all I think cuts together pretty well thanks to our magnificent editor Ben Katz and uh, we'll be getting to that in just a few minutes. But Ben, what is our patent pending uh, close focus? This? Oh my God, close focus this week. How do we not talk about this? <laughs> it's about the strike authorization vote from the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was engineers. IATSE stands for International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Look at that. Look at you being right and me being <laughs> well, wrong. It's, I was, I was it's not me- the first, nor will it ever be the last time. I was a member of, of IATSE for, for many years, so I guess I, I should know that. So I, I paid them lots of money. Uh, so so, so IATSE is about to, well, they, we, I shouldn't say they're going to go on strike. They have authorized, they have a they vote have a to vote. authorize. Yes, the, uh, the, the membership has to authorize for a strike, but I, I really think that it's going to happen this time. I really yeah. think it, it's... And, and it's against the uh, AMPTP, which is... The Association of Motion Picture and Television Producers, if I'm yes. not mistaken. I did uh, a, a long time ago, in like 2007, I wrote an article for creative screenwriting called Fighting Words. That was about the 1988 Writers Guild strike, and I got to do a lot of research into the AMPTP and, and how they work. And let's just say that they're not always the best faith uh, negotiators. Like, they have all the money, and they have all the power, and so, you know, they're... uh, Like, in 1988, the Writers Guild strike was about home video, Mm. and then there was another strike in 2007, and that was about streaming. And, uh, you know, like, whenever new technology or whatever new thing comes down the pike and um I, I was actually talking to our composer on the show and our good friend of the show who we now know actually listens to this stuff Kay Zalatrakshi and uh he is of the opinion that this is mostly about the clash between uh the technology companies Amazon and Netflix and stuff like that who are not super union friendly hmm. and and IATSE which is like for those of you who don't know it's like Almost every position on a on a movie, except director, writer, and actor, and casting director. Weirdly, oh, oh and, and and one more teamster, like drivers, uh, production assistants. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, production assistants fall under DGA. Oh, do they? I didn't. Well, think like they TPA did. would be a DGA uh, hmm. uh, thing, and it's like the the DGA is like first AD, second AD, second second, and key PA. And I think that PA is if you're a if you're a professional PA, you're eventually moving into the directors guild. You're 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 moving in a in an AD direction. But to me, the weirdest one is was when I found out that, and I don't know if this is still the case. So s- somebody feel free to correct me. But casting directors are part of the Teamsters Union. 
If they aren't still, they were not long ago. But basically, your grips, your electrics, your art, your entire art department, your editors, DPs. And casting directors are part of Local 399. Oh, are they? <laughs> but, yeah, that's the Teamsters. Oh, oh so I was right. <laughs> You're right, yes. Okay, so I was wrong once and right once. Great. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Since uh, 1928. <laughs> so it's, it's just odd that casting directors are part of the Teamsters. But uh, there's a joke in there about their uh, uh, driving us to get better talent. But um, <laughs> it's a terrible joke. <laughs> terrible right? joke. To not even, it doesn't even rise to the level of dad joke. It's sort of like uncle three times removed joke but anyway i you know uh, uh dps the, uh, virtually everyone we've spoken to on this show has probably been in iatsi and so if there's an iatsi strike that means that like all movies all tv all everything are just gonna grind to a halt or be shot non-union and that was uh, i was talking actually to uh also uh, our good friend george foyt and i was like what do you think are the chances that uh the amptp gives I add to the middle finger and says, uh, we're going to go shoot in Georgia where it's a right to work state and, and just hires all non-union DPs and stuff. I mean, the thing is like, it's possible. There are perfectly good non-union everything. And there always have been because there are people who work their asses off and just never want to be in the union or never get into the union. But, you know, like any of the name brand DPs, editors, costume designers, on and on and on. Uh, all of those people, they're all in the union. So, I, I mean, it effectively shuts production down. It might it might mean another boom for reality television, which is my own private hell, but... I, I think you might see uh, reality. I also think you might see some overseas productions. I think you might see... like, And I think that the, the streaming services have never had to face this sort of thing before. So this is, uh, this is going to be an interesting trial by, by fire, so to speak. Uh, I, I can't say 100% that the strike authorization is going to be approved, but I'll tell you, the vocal IATSE membership out there is overwhelmingly in favor. In fact, I don't really see anyone saying that they're not in favor of this. And the number one big issue, which has never been addressed, which really needs to be addressed, I think everybody who works on the set wants this addressed, with maybe the exception of the AMPTP, uh, is hours, the yeah. hours. And let me tell you, uh, the hours is a big reason why I do not work freelance in the, in the industry anymore. That, that The hours super, super suck. The hours are uh, not really like anything except for possibly like uh, hospitals or meatpacking. It's like almost no one well, works the and, hours. And now that, they, uh, uh, George was actually telling me that on a lot, of sh a lot of the bigger shoots, they're just expected to work straight through lunch. Like they they don't give them a 30-minute break which is, you know, kind of been mandated by the unions forever. And it would always be 30 minutes starting from when the last person had gotten lunch. So if you're the first person who got lunch, you know, maybe 45 minutes. But still, it's like, you know, letting people get off their feet and not think about their job for, for a half an hour is not, I don't think, a humongous ask. <laughs> it's not. But, I mean, you, you'd be surprised. Also, um, it's been proven time and again that meal penalties and triple golden time are not sufficient deterrence for producers not to not to take advantage of those things yeah like the, the extra money is uh secondary and it, it seems crazy to me because you could have just added extra days but extra days do cost usually the talent a lot more so yeah. it's it's really sort of talent driven so uh I, I don't know maybe there'll have to be a realignment of uh salary expectations across the board in order to give people a more humane working condition but let me tell you people who work freelance in in france think that we're all loons because they don't have hours like this they've figured it out there they work a very sane very short day by by comparison to what we do i mean i, I get that when you're in production Every once in a while, you're going to have to pull an all-nighter. or You're going to have to, you know, like, we're losing this location after today. And it's like, if it's an every once in a while thing, I don't know anyone who isn't willing to kind of rally and kind of push to get to get over that hump. But when... It's just Tuesday. Yeah. And it's when just it's like every day. Every fucking day is like that. It's it's just not right. And you kind of go, okay, like, if, if I worked at a bank, uh, no. <laughs> I, I would work eight hours, eight to ten hours a day. That would be it. I would have a lunch. Yeah. And I'd be sitting at a desk in an air conditioned place. I wouldn't be lifting heavy gear and moving it around. And it always reminds me about that old joke uh, about uh, the, 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 the elephant. Yeah. The, the circus <laughs> worker and the elephant and the, the guy who has to clean up the elephant shit. And he's like behind the elephant and the elephant keeps shitting on me on him. And at the end of the day, he's got like elephant shit caked into his hair and into his clothes. And uh, passerby says, why don't you just quit? And he says, what? And leave showbiz? 
Exactly. I feel like I feel like there's a lot of that going on, uh, where where it's like you know you're you're lucky because you know you get to work on I'm not gonna yeah uh, I'm not I'm not gonna impugn a specific show, but uh, okay. you know it's like we all know what they are yeah but, and it's like look uh, they, they are great jobs and it's a fun job and it and it is a calling and it is uh, not unlike the circus, but uh, <laughs> but I, I do think that like would it. I, I've worked on projects. I remember I worked on a project years ago that was the most friggin' humane thing, but it was like all exteriors and it was shot during the winter. So our days were rarely more than 10 hours. And it was like, oh, cool. I can actually like have some energy and go home and do my laundry or, you know, walk my dog or something like I, I actually can do other things besides uh, go home, fall dead asleep, <laughs> wake up and come Repeat. right back to your yes. set to keep making your show. Um, yeah. You know, and it's it, I mean, people think of it as as all glamorous but in like unless you're the star or the director which are the the, the stars and or even just all the cast and directors are the vast minority of the crew <laughs> like it's so many more people to to make these things i don't think it's uh, insane to give them you know eight to ten hour days <laughs> like why couldn't we schedule it like that and when you're talking about like we're talking about technology companies like amazon who uh, obviously is not exactly the most pro-union company anyway but like amazon netflix on and on and on apple and, and they apple they make they do make great stuff but like they're making so much money on these streaming services would it kill them to increase the budget so that the people who are working on these shows have like human normal, not in, insane hours. You you have to give it. You have to give a crap about the people who are working and making your your projects to start with. But um, assuming that you do that, then you have to uh, also take the next step and go like, oh well, these people should get the same amount of sleep that that you know I'm I would get or anyone else would get. You yeah. Know, on a, on anything. So. And again, I plug the great Haskell Wexler documentary, Who Needs Sleep which came out, I think it was probably 10 or 15 years ago. And it, and it was about this very freaking subject. And, and he was only asking to do a 12-hour day. Yeah. <laughs> only. Yeah, just trying to get it down to 50% no, more than what the, the average, you know, uh, full-time work is. And a 12-hour day, I mean, like, I, I mean, we've both done them. If they suck. When I was yeah, 22 it's... years old, nothing would make me happier than doing a 12-hour day on a movie set because uh, that's 12 hours I wasn't living my miserable 22-year-old life. But... But at the same time, I, I, I feel like at a, at a certain point, people have spouses or have kids or have any other things in their life besides, you know, making NCIS. The, 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 problems, the problems were, too, that it wasn't also just a maximum 12 hour day, 12 hours where a lot of. A lot of days uh, really would start to begin because, like those last hours of the day too, are, are the particularly brutal because you've been on your feet. You might be in, in poor weather or, or you know climate conditions, and then uh, you're just dead tired from having you know probably hauled or moved heavy equipment or done stuff that was physically exerting for hours and hours, or had to be mentally challenged. So, and I say this as someone who, uh, when I started out, as you know, I started out as a makeup artist, but I also did a bunch of like art department PA stuff uh, in and around. In fact, my war story was all about being in the art department on a commercial for Alpha Insurance. And you show me a DP who worked 12 hours, and I'm going to show you an art department PA who worked 15 hours on the same day. Pretty accurate. Yeah. So like, you know, because that DP showed up and the set was prepped and ready for them. And then they had a company move and you had that, you know, we had to stagger people around and move stuff around. So it's like, you know, to, to create a, an accurate 12 hour day, you, you actually have to factor in like the, the support crew around it, the PAs, the, you know, er, everything else. And those people often are working far shittier hours. And, uh, you know, it, it, to a degree, it's like, you know, a, a rite of passage for a lot of us to work these incredible unhealthy hours. When you're 22 years old, you know, you can you can work your body like that. But I feel like even 10 years later, it's not a great idea. No, you, you age a lot working those hours. I, I know I, I certainly did. But but hey, uh, you know what? I think that there might be a light at the end of the tunnel, at least if uh, the union really sticks to its guns, they really do strike, and the AMPTP steps up and does what's right. I, I, that, I think that's really what, what people are waiting for. There's a bunch of other things they need to, to work on, too. But if they addressed ours, they would get huge, huge uh, respect, I think, from uh, from now, from the vast majority of IOTC. They would. And I mean, it, really, this couldn't be happening at a worse time for our economy because it's like we're just kind of limping back into into motion. And, you know, and, and so like here in L.A., where a lot of our industry uh, or a lot of our economy centers around the entertainment industry to have it shut down right now would be horrendous. 
but still, you know, I, I, I stand with IATSE on this one for sure. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's, it's been said that one in 12 Angelinos work in the industry, but I will tell you, depending on what you, neighborhood you're in, uh, that, that number jumps up to, I think, like one in two or, for one, real? or one in one. It's like, it's, it's, it's kind of incredible, no. but yeah, pretty incredible as, as a, like, a, you know, we're, we're a steel town, but our steel is movies and yes. television. So uh, anyway, hey, let's get to the interview with John Gulisarian. Here we go. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. All right, so I am here in uh, beautiful Burbank, California with John Goulis Sarian. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So the first question that I always start off with is my completely fallacious belief that cinematographers tend to come from one school or another. And uh, you can agree or disagree. You can reject my premise entirely, but I'm just interested to hear your point of view here. Either when you're reading a script, I imagine some DPs are imagining the compositions that they're going to create to tell the story, and some are imagining the lighting. So where would you say you fit in that continuum? Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, I'm thinking about the story. I'm just thinking about if the story works more than anything. Mm -hmm. Definitely not thinking about lighting when I read a script for the first time. I mean, I think you visualize some shots or you start to think about other movies that it reminds you of or photographs that it reminds you of and things like that. But I'm definitely not thinking. I mean, lighting would be the last thing I'm thinking about. Um, so I'm putting you down for composition. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think by the end of something, you definitely have an idea like, oh, you know, this movie's going to have a lot of scope or you know, this movie should feel claustrophobic or whatever. And mm -hmm. you start to think about lenses, but it's definitely not like when I'm reading the first act of something, I don't think I'm thinking about either. So let's, let's go back and uh, talk a little bit about your background. Like when did it first occur to you that this was a direction you wanted to go in with your life? You know, did you go to film school or what was your, what was your path to do it? A lot of film school, uh, film yeah. school where? Well, I decided when I was in high school that I wanted to go to Columbia College in Chicago. I actually, like when I started researching that, I found out that a lot of people went to Columbia College and then went to AFI. Oh. So that just became my plan. And that's what I did. I went oh, to wow. Columbia and then I went to AFI. Sweet. I'm always interested to talk to people about the value of film school today. And some people even, you know, kind of reach out and ask us about that, you know, because when uh, you and I went to film school, you would go there in part for access to gear or whatever. But today anyone can get themselves, you know, their hands on a decent camera and some decent editing stuff and make gazillions of films. So what do you think were like the real values that you got out of going to both of those schools? First of all, I think the fact that anyone has access to gear makes film school even more important because mm -hmm. it's not about gear. And I think it was, it seemed like it was for me when I started. And Columbia College is a very gear centric place, you know, but I went in the days of like shooting on Bolexes and editing on Steenbecks and Moviolas. And like, that was actually the great thing. I mean, I'm really glad that I went there and learned that because I think that really pushed me towards cinematography even more and i wish i could remember this person's name but i remember when like sitting down with like an advisor when i first started and they're like so what do you what are you interested in as a filmmaker and i was like cinematography like i mean i thought everybody was starting just going to be a director mm -hmm. and uh you know and i said i'm interested in cinematography and they were like well this is what you should do don't take any film classes right away take photography classes for because hmm. there's a, a great photography program there too said so, you know get your general education courses done and at the same time take photography classes and then save your film classes for like your second or third year uh and so i did that like my first semester at columbia i took photo one i'm really grateful for that experience like where we would just you know you'd get a project every week you'd take black you'd just you know, walk around the city with your camera, take black and white shots. You would do them in your canister and then print them yourselves. And, and I, I feel like I learned a lot about film in general and how to expose film and all that. And then started taking film classes there where you shoot on a Bolex, which 
is like I think every cinematographer should start by shooting on a Bolex because it's just like the most basic version of cinematography. Yeah, it's like you're loading your film into it. You're you you know it's a camera. There's no sound. You wind it. You, you know the, you you have three lenses on it if you're lucky. So you're learning about focal lengths. You're learning about photochemical process. You're learning about the mechanics of cameras, things like that. But at the same time, it's like that's not what it was about. It was about working with other people and you know there are lots of people like there's a very diverse body of students and you're collaborating with them and that's important well and, and i think that that's always the the number one value that i would always espouse to film school which is that you're going to meet people and your their ideas are going to rub off on you your ideas are going to rub off on them and in some cases you're even going to work together you know maybe for your entire careers oh sure yeah but AFI was different. Like you really just focus on storytelling at AFI. So I was grateful to have that Columbia experience and then go to AFI. But I mean, I you know made the first movies that I made with directors that I met at, or with a director that I met at AFI. Who was that? Drake Doremus. Mm-hmm. You know, we still work together. You know, and my wife was in the class. We we actually met in Chicago, and then she came and went to AFI the year after me. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so, you know, and I keep in touch with tons of people. <laughs> yeah, like uh, like most of my friends are cinematographers. Not most of my friends, but like <laughs> a lot of my friends are cinematographers that I went to AFI with. Yeah. Does going to a school like AFI give you a lot of connections that enabled you to move directly into a professional career? Or like what was the transition from from going to a school even as prestigious as AFI to, to uh, working professionally? It's different for everyone. For me, it was um, it was definitely a struggle at first. Mm-hmm. It would just sort of do whatever you could. I sur- I wasn't really good at being a grip or an electric or an AC or whatever. So I had to sort of just make a decision like, okay, I'm going to just try to be a DP. Yeah. And then a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of luck too. It doesn't matter how talented you are or how many people you know. It's just, it, it takes a lot of luck. And I was lucky to have a few really good opportunities. So, Is there one that you would say was the thing that broke the ice for you professionally? Yeah, probably Like Crazy. Mm-hmm. The, I think it was the third movie I made, but mm-hmm. it was a, a movie that people saw. So that movie was based on an outline, not a full script. The way we dissected that outline was, I mean, it still was like, these are the scenes in the movie. Mm-hmm. There was just no dialogue written. Occasionally there was like a, this person will say this at some point, but the movie was very improvisational as well. So what we did is Drake and I sat together. We talked about how we were going to approach every scene. And so we just like started going through it chronologically over and over again. You know, and then we started finding reference pictures and things like that and put it, you know, so we would, we just kept going through chronologically and like putting everything in this database. And then we started to realize like patterns and things like that and said, okay, well, as this starts to progress in the movie, you know, when they're, they're becoming disconnected here, let's like, how do we find a visual way to represent that? So this, these are the things that we want. But then like fully knowing that the movie was going to be improv. I had no idea that it was improvised. Yeah. And it wasn't just improvised dialogue. It was improvised blocking as well is what that was my question was like, so were you involved in figuring out the blocking and figuring out like the choreography of each scene? Yeah, I mean, I think I was kind of put in a position where it was like, okay, so let's start every scene in a way that we can let them figure out the blocking. We can let the actors figure out the blocking. Wow. And we'll shoot it like that. And if it's working, we'll keep going with it. And if it's not working, we'll like go back to square one. Dopey question. Did you guys shoot it in sequence? As much as possible, we shot it in sequence. It seems like it would be hard to do something like that fully improvised without doing it in sequence because it's sort of... Well, what we couldn't do in sequence, um, we did a couple movies like this where it was all improvised, but he's very smart about giving himself versions of things. And we'll just like roll and roll and roll and roll. And then, you know, like, okay, well, if it goes this way, then we're going to want this version. And if it goes this way, we're going to want, you know, so he w- he would do all of that. But you got to be but, careful. You can't like let your whole narrative dovetail into 50 different directions. Like, you know, it's oh, yeah. it's, it's got to stay on, on. There's got to be a guardrail yeah. somewhere. But there were definitely like production reasons that we couldn't shoot. Like, you know, if there was a location that was in the first 10 scenes and then in the last 
10 scenes it wasn't reasonable to like shoot it and then go back there so there were like a couple of things that Mm -hmm. that we did have to we had to do out of sequence so if, if you could walk me through like just an example of of this process of creating a scene the way that you're describing sure there's a scene in the movie where they go on their first date and they're at a coffee shop and we had decided The way that we're going to do this is they're going to be sitting outside, like on the patio of the coffee shop, and our camera is going to be inside in the back of the place on a long lens, looking through the window, seeing them outside. Mm -hmm. And when they're doing, I think we shot that like the first day, you know, so because of that, they can be sitting out there improvising. No one out. They can't see any film crew, you know, like we're, we're inside long lens. They know we're rolling, whatever, but they can. and, And we would just roll for like. 30 minutes. What are you shooting on? We're shooting on uh, 7D with the, I believe it was the prototype hot rod cameras PL mount adapter. That was accidental. I had no <laughs> idea that I was log rolling for Ilya there. I would never do that intentionally. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so, and I think at the time you could only roll for 12 minutes, or yeah, something, you yeah. know, and then I would like quickly like roll again. I had no idea that that was, uh, that was that movie primarily shot on DSLR? All. Oh. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. So we would do that. And so the the whole scene would happen. And then we knew, like, I remember that scene specifically. We're like, well, they're getting to know each other, so they're not connected yet. So we're going to shoot the whole scene from inside here. We did their close-ups in profile from inside. We never, like, came around and did close-ups on them. So we knew that's how we wanted to do. But it allowed the whole scene to be improv. But also we had very specific aesthetic choices that we wanted to achieve. Well, and you've, d- you've done a lot of like romantic movies, like movies that kind yeah. of have romance at the center. Now, would you yeah. s- say that that was, was that an aesthetic that was easy for you to move into? I ended up doing a lot of romantic movies because I did that movie. Mm-hmm. And for a long time, that was what people asked me to do mm-hmm. because it was a movie that had an aesthetic that people were looking for. And yeah, so it just sort of happened that way. <laughs> I actually made a pretty big effort at some point to be like, I want to do something, some different stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm always trying to find the key to someone's aesthetic sensibility. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, when you're a cinematographer, you end up working for different directors and you kind of have to serve somebody else's vision a lot of times. But all of your work that I've seen feels like it's really strongly in line with whatever the aesthetic sensibility is. And so you have a lot of these, you know, kind of romantic movies like Like Crazy. But then also you have Tim and Eric, awesome show, great job, which to me is like anarchy writ large. And it's <laughs> is like a weird, sweaty, feels like an old tape you found in the basement. Yeah. And the aesthetic of that is so strong and so specific to those guys. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm always trying to thread the needle of figuring out like, what is the thread that runs through those things aesthetically for you? I mean, I like to think there isn't necessarily a thread for me. Which is fair. That's totally fair. Yeah. I want to be constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. And Tim and Eric was, to me, that was just fun. It was like they would call the night before and just, you know, ask, all right, (laughs) can you come down tomorrow and we're just shooting something and here's a quarter (laughs) of a page script or whatever. And sometimes it was bigger than that. It's like creepy sketch comedy, like... Yeah. Like it's a nerving <laughs> sketch comedy and yeah. intentionally. So it's, it's, you yeah. know, I mean, they're just geniuses. They're, <laughs> they they're, really are. Yeah. <laughs> and the, yeah, they were doing something really specific. Yeah. So in between film school and Tim and Eric, you were mostly focused on being a cinematographer. Were you doing a lot of camera operation or I know you said you, you didn't really go down the grip path. I mean, I sometimes wonder about that because like a really good friend of mine who I thought was an outrageously talented cinematographer and I went to college with her. She moved out here. She was a little bit older than all of us. She was in her late thirties when she was in school with us and she was a great cinematographer and won some fellowship and all this stuff. And then when she came out here, she's like, I'm not going to lug anybody else's gear. Uh, and so she gave up on being a cinematographer entirely. And I was like, just say you're going to be a DP. You know, I, I know other people, um, Illy and I have a friend named Neil Fredericks. That was his MO when he first moved out here. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can go slow, but it's, it's something you were able to do, right? Yeah. I mean, I think I had a couple of small jobs as a DP. You know, I think I was shooting short films for free and things yeah. like that for friends. But, you know, I like taught myself how to make websites for a while and I was doing that. Oh, wow. And someone once told me, like, don't work on movies in a way that you don't want to be known. 
And I don't necessarily agree with this anymore, but I think at the time I thought like, oh, I don't want to be a grip on something because then people just think that's what I do. So also, like if you end up being kind of successful as a grip and move up to yeah. like the top of being key grips on giant things, yeah. then you don't but, move towards your actual dream. Yeah. And it's, it, I think it makes it, it's hard for people to see you in a different way, which I don't, I don't know. I don't necessarily know if I agree with that anymore because I constantly see things in people and say, oh, you know, you're a good focus puller or, or a good dolly grip or whatever, but you should be a camera operator or you should, you know, like, like. Well, but even in the union, isn't there kind of a hierarchy of that? So uh, a friend of mine who is an amazing first AC was kind of forced in, into being an operator where she wasn't able to get as many uh, days, as, you know, working. Yeah. But it was like she did so many hours as an AC and, and like kind of had to move into the next field. But that is, but there's also kind of a normal progression of moving up to being a DP. Through, I mean, but then there's work. a lot of people who, you know, are focus pullers and want to be operators and it takes a really long time to get there and they just need an opportunity as yeah. well. My wife is what my wife worked at a flower shop for a while after she got out of AFI. And mm. I played a lot of online poker, you know, like <laughs> for money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard to go from having that support system of film school to to not having it anymore, for too. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it took a lot of luck. And, and, you know, actually, one of the luckiest things as far as getting paid to be a cinematographer was my wife got a job working on some web shows. And it was because she was a production designer at AFI and like the person that they had hired as the dolly grip on her thesis film a year later or so like got a job directing a web show and called my wife and was like i need to hire a production designer and you're the only one i've ever known because i worked on this (laughs) thing so do you want to do it and she's like yeah they liked what she did and they hired her to do more and they ended up like it was like a new like startup company and they hired her and put her on salary as a production designer and then like a couple months later they got bought by disney and so she got folded into like being a disney employee oh that's sweet (laughs) and they started hiring me to shoot and it was the only reason that when drake asked me if i could do like crazy that i could be like I could say yes, you know, (laughs) because I wasn't getting paid very much to do that movie either. But I did have like a little bit of freedom to be like, okay, I'm going to take a month, spend a lot of time really focusing on this. My favorite movie that I've done is About Time. Well, let's move on to About Time. So that was directed by Richard Curtis, right? Yeah, yeah. He did like four weddings and a funeral and a bunch of stuff that I remember, especially from the 90s. Yeah. So how did you end up on that project? So Light Crazy had just come out and uh, Richard Curtis was planning this movie and he knew it was going to be a smaller movie than his previous. He did like Love Actually and then a movie called The Boat That Rocked, which was called Pirate Radio here. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. With Philip Seymour Hoffman. Both like really good movies. And he saw Light Crazy and kept talking about it with his producers and saying, you know, I want it to feel like this i wanted to feel intimate like this and then they were like well why don't you call the person who shot that and you know i had never i didn't really feel like i had ever shot a real movie at the time really i mean i feel like like crazy was kind of a big deal and honestly it was a small it was a really small movie it's a small movie but i feel like it made a big impact and also uh i didn't know until this conversation that it was shot on dslr and i feel like i mean we've interviewed shane hurlbut and you know like he was getting all kinds of PR and stuff about shooting DSLR. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that was covered by American Cinematographer. I don't remember reading about Like Crazy specifically. I never even heard it brought up in those discussions. Yeah, well, I mean, at first it was, I remember our producers telling us, like, don't talk about when the movie was at Sundance. Like, don't talk about what the budget was or how we shot it or anything like that. Because they wanted to sell it. Yeah, you know? yeah of course. And they didn't want people to be like, oh, this is it cheap movie we can get it for cheap uh (laughs) um, fair and then once they sold it they were like yeah talk about it as much as you want (laughs) so uh moving to about time yeah he was going after kind of the aesthetic or the process or yeah i mean i think that in his he he just had an idea that he wanted it to feel intimate Mm -hmm. and he had you know that movie was fresh in his mind he had just seen it had just come out and you know they sent me the script and i read it and thought there's no way that they'll ever hire me for this movie (laughs) and then i skyped with him because he was in london Mm -hmm. we got along and you know i hung up the skype and like 
you know, an hour later, somebody called me and they're like, oh, he wants you to come out to meet in person. Sweet. They wanted to know if they were going to get along with me or not. <laughs> but I mean, uh, at that point, you already had the gig, right? No. Oh. No, I hadn't been hired. I, I came out for like an in-person interview, which Whoa. I thought I was just going to sit and like interview with him. <laughs> But we ended up scouting. Well, and, at the, and at this stage, would it be fair to say this is probably the most established filmmaker that you... you yeah, definitely. You, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we got along and I flew back home and found out that he wanted to hire me and then went directly back. Oh, man. <laughs> and then spent uh, <laughs> a summer in London and oh, that Cornwall. Like it was 2012 when the Olympics were there. And oh, no. It was great, actually. Oh, was like it? for me, it was just like a, it, sounds, it was it an adventure. Sounds like a shooting nightmare. Like you're holding for sound every five minutes. For yeah, sure. I mean, we we worked around it, and mm-hmm. it was it was great. So you know, between like crazy and that, like you know, those are two humongous steps. Each one is a giant step. What was different, and what was unexpected about working on on a film with uh you know with with that kind of cast, with that kind of director? Well, I was still operating the A camera, but we always had a second. Mm-hmm. But I was sort of just figuring things out. I wanted to give him what he saw in Like Crazy, but I also wanted to make his movie. The thing I love about the movie is it does feel like we threw away a lot of conventions. It wasn't just like a movie with coverage, not just like shooting a wide shot and then going in and shooting coverage, which, you know, to me at the time, it seemed like that's what a lot of movies like that were. I I didn't really know that I would make movies like that ever, you know? (laughs) When you're in a situation like that, do you ever get any pushback from the producer where it's like, hey, we have this giant location and we're seeing, you know, three square inches and it's out of focus or whatever. I'm not saying that's what you did, but are you ever getting pressure to be like, showcase the giant scope of this, even though you were kind of hired to find the, you know, the more intimate. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, you know, something on that movie that I was also trying to do is realize, oh, there are sets now (laughs) you know and there's a lot of storytelling going on on the sets and how do we find that balance between showing that and then also figuring out when to throw it away the balance between scope and intimacy is important And, and i was that was like the first time i was learning that was on that movie when i was at columbia Mm -hmm. i had a laser disc player oh yeah pre dvd Oh, I'm, I had a roommate and, named Jeremy Galise who uh, he had a laser. He'll still argue with you that Laserdisc is better than DVD. Yeah. I mean, who cares now? But, it's true. Uh, anyway, I had a Laserdisc player. I was a movie nerd. I had no money. I was like a freshman in college and I was at Tower Records and the Criterion Collection Dead Ringers box set oh, wow. had just come out on Laserdisc and it was $99. And I had probably a hundred and thirty dollars to my name, and I fucking bought it. Worth every penny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that movie is. And the- I re- and I like I like I had that like you know that feeling you'd have when you were like young and broke and you'd spend a lot of money on something and you know you shouldn't have. Yes. I had that feeling, um, but I got over it real quick. <laughs> yeah. No, that movie. I, that movie holds up brilliantly. And yeah. uh, recently, I want to say it was Shout Factory or somebody re-released it on yeah. Blu-ray. They remastered everything. And uh, I watched it and I realized, like, honestly, how formative that movie was to everything that I think about movies. I know it's a it's not yeah. a movie that like it's a lot of uh, people talking about it. But man, oh, man. And, and Jeremy Irons has never given a better performance. And he's one of our finest actors. I mean, I actually got to reference it recently because I'm um, something you wouldn't expect. Uh, I, well, first of all, like it had, it was also the first movie that I ever had all the features. It had like the commentary and oh, wow. it had like the behind the scenes stuff about all the twinning and whatever. Well, the behind the scenes stuff on that movie is just bananas. And, yeah, and today it would, seem, it would seem crazy, but the lengths that they went to to have yeah. dolly shots where yeah. Jeremy Irons is talking to himself. Yeah. Crazy. Well, so I just did a movie where Seth Rogen plays two characters. And um, I did sort of revisit that for a moment, like all of those behind the scenes. Well, like, and even though the technology has made that a whole lot easier, it's still a lot of the same principles are, are at play, correct? Were you doing like motion control kind of work or? No, we like decided to not do motion control. We mm-hmm. um, we we did it like pretty simply, actually. Like most of our split screens were either like, Real simple moves, or they were just like locked off. Locked off, yeah. What's this movie? 
It's called An American Pickle. An American Pickle. Who directed that? Brandon Trost. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was so much fun to make. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like the funny version of Dead Ringers. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's exactly what it is. Uh, when Alana, our producer, asked me, like, Ben, would you be willing to see Candyman? I was like, oh, oh, twist my arm to see the thing that I would definitely go see no matter what. So we went and saw it a couple of weeks ago or last week. Firstly, just congratulations for shooting the number one movie in America. First off, uh, second off, just a gorgeous movie. Just, you know, just so, some amazing, amazing work. And it's interesting because it's sort of a direct sequel to the original Candyman, which came out in 1992. Or I don't know if I lose my horror cred if I admit out loud that I haven't seen Day of the Dead or Farewell to the Flesh, the the two sequels. But I'm just curious how much going into Candyman Candyman, uh, were you studying those, or the original film or the original films? So not, not the second two, but the original one, I recall in the production office, they had all these televisions around and they just played it on a loop for weeks, like with, like without sound oh, wow. mostly. So when I was sitting at my desk, whenever I was thinking about something and I'd sort of like gaze off. I would see a monitor and the movie would just be playing there. So I'd pick it up at different points in the movie too. And I feel like it really seeped in and was kind of inspiring. And it, it's kind of nice to see it without sound and really like think about the great visuals to it. It was such a well shot movie. You know, we really wanted this one to, we wanted to feel like that one. So. <laughs> I often talk about the horror movie desert that was the 1990s. Like, there just weren't that many great horror movies in the 1990s. But Candyman, whenever I would say that, I would always have to make an exception for Candyman. Because it's just, I mean, it's kind of a gothic romance in a way. But it's super creepy, that Philip Glass score. Everything about it is is just, it's so amazing. And probably like a lot of people, when I heard that Jordan Peele was going to executive produce a new uh, installment, I would, you know, I was like, well, that couldn't possibly be more perfect. That's a, a, a great person to kind of take this on. And Nia DaCosta, the director, had some heat off of her first film, but this is like her first big, big studio film. I'm curious because there's so many amazing sequences in this film that are so well conceived and it doesn't ever repeat itself. It's not the same kind of sequence shot the same kind of way. You have one sequence that's shot like outside an apartment building in a window through a window and you can see everybody else in the building or the condos or whatever. And, and it's gorgeous. And then you have uh, a lot of people have already talked about the sequence in the bathroom with all the teenage girls and the, the little mirror. on. And I was just curious how the sequences were built. Was that like all in the script were, were y'all working off of uh storyboards or like what what was what was the method for creating these sequences so it was a combination of things some of them were just shot listed mm-hmm. some of them were storyboarded some of them were storyboarded then fully pre a lot of it really depended on how many visual effects were in it if it was a visual effects heavy sequence they got fully pre the art gallery kill sequence that was fully prevised and I and and stuck to like exactly like we yeah. you know same lenses everything that we did in the previs yeah so I mean it it really just depended on the sequence and but you know I came onto the movie with only four weeks of prep <laughs> oh wow yeah so Nia had been working for a while she and she's brilliant at at prep. Uh, she has such a vision for everything and she was very prepared at that point. I, we worked just every single day, seven days a week for those four. I think it was, maybe it was five weeks, but it was, uh, it was a abbreviated prep. And in most movies, the camera and lighting department goes out of their way to avoid reflections. But in this movie, reflections are an intrinsic part of the storytelling. And sometimes they're the most important thing or, you know, like it's often supposed to not draw your eye, but in not drawing your eye be the really scary thing in the background. But it's not even in the background. It's in a reflection of the background or something. Can you talk about how you went about planning for that kind of stuff? Did it have mostly to do with like figuring out what the location was or were you ever like, oh, we're in this room? 
room. Let's put a mirror right here so that we can get, you know, this or that. Or let's put a window right here so we can do the reflection. And also, like, what, uh, was that stuff done practically or was that stuff, uh, was was it done in VFX or is it a mishmash of both? Or, like, you know, t- t- tell me about reflections. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, a mis- it was a mismatch of both. It was, uh, a, a lo- I mean, it's all planned. There's maybe one mirror shot in that whole movie that wasn't planned and I think it was when he's at his mother's apartment and we like shoot the exit them walking out of the apartment in the reflection of the mirror which I think that was oh, like such a great shot yeah which it, that was like a just inspired in the moment thing like hey we should do this right like and then oh, that was so good, so good. Yeah. That, that might be my favorite one of all of them, too, because it, yeah, it was just so, uh, I don't know, unexpected in that scene. Yeah, and it's just a, you know, that was just a practical thing. It was like, that just worked out, and, you know, there's no VFX. But, yeah, the art gallery sequence, obviously, that's all planned. Like, there was a gallerist hired to, to actually lay out that, all of the artwork in the gallery, and... Um, uh, you know, so that it was, it was really important to everybody that it felt like a real gallery and real art and real show like all those things should go together but also we wanted we needed the opportunity for reflections so those sculptures were chosen and placed where they were placed and prevised like so that we knew that like the neon that was uh you know one of the the piece of art is a piece of neon would reflect in the sculpture when we looked at it from this way and that the and obviously his piece which is a mirror you know that's placed in a specific place so that we would see other things yeah. behind it and and then the you know, reflection in like the office windows and the door and all that was planned like that's all like that was built so that so we could see those reflections when we wanted to see those reflections yeah and it was really challenging but so fun and we had the best production designer Kara Brower who like just is kind of brilliant about things like that and I give her a, a, you know most of the credit for that because she was always great about laying things out so that they work for the blocking of the sequence and that it you know it was great and then and then within that a lot of that becomes visual effects that we would actually shoot it but there's no way to avoid ourselves uh, the camera because we want to see it direct on so we get painted out and that's a pretty difficult process to a lot of passes go into that and a lot of a lot of work after the fact and you would have like some of the shots uh correct me if i'm wrong where uh we're seeing Candyman uh, reflected our moving shots were you doing any kind of motion control stuff or was that stuff that we were just able to do in post now uh, a, a lot of times motion control is unnecessary because you can just repeat your move and it doesn't have to be like they're sophisticated enough now that they can take what they need out of that and, and use it as long, you know, as long as you're doing it on a track and it's pretty close to what it was. Yeah. I'm sure it's easier for them with motion control, but motion control is so time consuming that it's hard on a schedule like what Candyman was to be able to do that. And it's time consuming and expensive. The same thing, like on American Pickle, we did a lot of that stuff too, where it was like, we just do it on a dolly track and we try to repeat the exact same move and somebody from visual effects is standing there and saying, okay, that was good or that wasn't good and you and you move on. <laughs> <laughs> what what you can do in visual effects is pretty amazing and, you know, especially if you're giving them real elements. I'm sure there's a way to make it work. Uh, maybe, you know, motion control, you know, becomes more of a niche thing or already has. Um, also one of the, one of the visual elements that you have in this movie that that's, it's a really unique element is sort of an expository technique used in the film repeatedly of these, uh, like shadow puppets. Did you shoot those elements as well? No, a company named manual cinema, uh, did all those sequences, but we did some, we, we worked that aesthetic into some of the scenes of the movie as well. And it's such a cool way to to see the rather than cutting to clips of the original yeah. movie, which would be stupid and would never happen in this movie. Like it's such a great way to 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 do it. And Nia had had a real specific vision for what she wanted that to be, and they did a brilliant job. I loved how how handmade it looked, and you even like see hands manipulating the the puppets from time to time. It was a really cool idea. Did you, can I ask you? Did you get to see it with an audience? I did, yeah. I saw it in the regular old, regular. I saw it at the Cinemark in North Hollywood. Oh, great, cool. 
Cool. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous because I, I have I've seen it probably like six or eight times through the process, but it's always been sitting because it was during this pandemic that I've always been sitting in a theater all by myself reviewing. Oh, so I've never seen it with an audience and I, I didn't make it. It's here in Ireland, but I haven't made it to a theater to see it. And now I'm, I feel like it might be sad, like. It's a few weeks out in, in a, you know, country. Maybe there won't be anyone there. <laughs> it's probably okay. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, we've actually talked about it on the podcast a little bit because, like, you know, I still have yet to sit down and eat in a restaurant since the pandemic started. Starting maybe, like, four or five months ago, movie theaters seemed to be, like, they were very attuned to safety and going out of their way uh, to make it as safe uh, an experience as possible. And for the podcast... Uh, I would have gone to see Candyman either way, but for the podcast, you know, I've I, I've gone to a handful of screenings, and you know, it's like the difference between a restaurant and a movie theater is you can wear a mask in the in the movie theater, so you know, you can you can at least be safer. Yeah, true. I imagined I would watch it at the ArcLight on opening weekend, and I would be <laughs> able to see it with a crowd of people, like, and, and judge their reactions. <laughs> yeah, but that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, that will never happen. The ArcLight doesn't exist anymore. It sucks. Yeah, and we talked about this on the podcast as well, and it, this doesn't really have to do with the cinematography, but I think it, it's noteworthy about the film is that uh, it's the first movie in history ever to have a woman of color direct it to be the number one at the box office, which on, I, I feel two ways about. On the one hand, congratulations to Nia and you and your entire crew and your whole team. On the other hand, it's like, it took us this long to get there? Like, this this should have been news in, like, 1968 or something. Like, it's it's kind of shocking to me that it's it's taken that long. Yeah, well, I, I feel the exact same way you do about it. And uh, I, I, I don't think it's it's uh, it's not the first and it won't be the last record that Nia DaCosta sure. breaks. So, <laughs> oh, good. Um, yeah, that's great to hear. She's yeah. a true, truly talented, passionate filmmaker, and she's going to do a lot of great stuff. No, it, it comes through and it, and it also just kind of warms my heart to think that like people who maybe never saw themselves as directors who are in middle school right now or high school or going to college are going to be like, oh, I, c I can follow in her footsteps and she can be an inspiration, you know, to to a generation of of, of more people who haven't had that specific distinction, you know, but it's still pretty amazing. But anyway, I, I, uh, just congratulations uh, top to bottom on, on the movie. Are you able to, t what are you able to say about the movie that you're shooting in Ireland right now? I can tell you, I, it's called Cocaine Bear. It's a movie about a bear that finds a bunch of cocaine and kills a bunch of people. So who doesn't want to see that? <laughs> is it like a horror film? Or is it it's like, a horror film. Uh, it's a comedy. It's an action film. It's everything. So And it's being directed by Elizabeth Banks, right? Correct. Yeah. So oh. it's a pretty exciting project, and uh, I am uh, I'm thrilled to be doing it. That's cool. Well, it'll follow in uh, the tradition of many an amazing bear movie, like uh, what was it, The Edge, uh, the David Mamet movie with uh, yeah. Alec Baldwin, and I'm forgetting who was the other person. Yeah, yeah it's exactly uh, like that. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Well, cool. Uh, I can't wait to have you back on the show to talk about Cocaine Bear. Yeah, I can't wait to come back. <laughs> it's, a funny, it's just a funny title. It really is. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for coming back. Uh, love your work. And, uh, you know, just amazing to, to it was amazing to get to see something on the big screen for a change. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks and, and, for and, having me. And thanks for watching it on the big screen. <laughs> So that was John Gulisarian. Uh Congrats again on Candyman, and uh, congrats all around. Yeah, uh, I can't wait to have you back on the show sometime. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah, we're starting to get, like, we've had a few people who've been on a few times now, and, uh, you know, it's it, it's, it's funny, because the first time we started doing that, it was like, uh, I think it might have been with uh, Checo Varese uh, or Faden Papa Michael, and it's like, okay, well, we've already done the one where we talked about your whole career, so we don't, we're not going to really do that again. We're only going to talk about one or two things. And uh, it's it's always pretty amazing to me. You can you can you can burn up uh, you can burn up forty five minutes <laughs> real fast, easy talking yeah. about one project and really drill down. So to me, it's it's a lot of fun. So uh, thanks, John. Hey, you know, I want to mention actually, we had a uh, a visitor here to Hot Red Cameras uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, Stefan came in the door, and Stefan, I never got your last name, and I, I didn't look it up before this, but if you're listening, hey, thanks for coming in and buying some Pelican cases from us. I it's really great to meet you, and uh, welcome to Los Angeles, and uh, th thanks for uh, supporting Hot Red Cameras and helping to keep the uh, the podcast going. That, that that's really wonderful. Keeping the podcast dream alive. Hey, Ben, you know what time it is? Uh, it looks like it's, uh, what is it? it's 4.30 on the nose. <laughs> it is 4.30 on the nose, but it's also time 
to pay the bills. We got to thank our uh, tremendous sponsor, Aperture. Aperture, maker of some high quality LED lights that are being well used by the motion picture industry now. They've really had a, a breakthrough year last year. They're getting used all over the place, but they announced a, a new light yesterday. A brand new light, which is an update, or I should say a larger version of their previous Nova P300C. It's now the P600C, and it's a two by one LED. So the last one was a one by one more or less. This is a two by one, and it's a soft panel light. It kind of reminds me of like an old zip light. Like, remember the zip lights from absolutely. back in the day? Yeah. Absolutely. Except this one doesn't create that much heat, and uh, it has four light engine control zones. So literally, it's like the, the panel's been divided into four, and you might not think that that matters too much, but you can do some really interesting sort of mixing and matching. And when you go into the fire flicker effect mode, something about just having that offset of like 12 inches from one side to the other yeah. creates really realistic flickers, like really re realistic oh, I bet flames. It does. Yeah. So you end up seeing like the shadows kind of dance around a little bit. And the way that you used to have to do that is you had two lights going. Now you can do it with one panel. And, th and that's really cool. And I don't actually, I, I really don't go for a lot of the sort of uh, gimmicky effects that are built into a lot of lights these days, but now it's it's, it's basically sort of like a free thing that comes there, but flame flicker, that is one of those things that used to buy a, you know, used to get a special box out on set, used yeah. to, get, you know, have a bunch of people working with I mean, there's some things that, cutters like, to try like, to, like standard things like fire, uh, police lights, yeah, there's a, there's a few stuff sure. like that, that yeah. like, you know, uh, having, having a light that can emulate those things, like you're going to use them a lot. So this is the brightest now, the brightest uh, two by one LED soft panel on the market. It's very, very bright, and it's also not the most expensive. It comes in about thirty three hundred bucks if you want just the light itself, and it jumps up to thirty five ninety if you want it with a case. And I gotta say that uh, if you were looking at a lot of other lights out there, this light still is not that big. It might get pretty big with a case. I haven't seen the case yet, so I don't know. It's also realistically not shipping until the first part of 2022 so it's three four maybe five months out but we actually have it in our shop right now at hot rod cameras Ooh. and uh, and i'm here i, I know can, you're here you i can, can go look at it go right look now. at it but uh it's not going to be here for that long but it will be coming back i understand that it, there's a there's a little uh event going on that uh very few people are going to go to called cinegear <laughs> <laughs> and that light is going to make an appearance there but it's supposed to come back to us right after cinegear so that's good news and then we'll we'll have it here for a little while so if more people can come in and check it out and everything else so that's awesome the aperture nova P600C is also available for pre-order over at Hot Rod Cameras, and uh, internally here we've sort of nicknamed it the Supernova, and uh, ah. I think that uh, I think that the Supernova is gonna gonna do really well. It's gonna be a popular light. Liz sure. Fair wrote a great song in the '90s about your light. Yeah, <laughs> no 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 connection. Wow. And now short ends. Hey, so Ben. It's now time for short ends. What is your uh, short end this week? Well, before I even get into my short end, I feel like we should follow up something that we talked about which uh, on our last show, which was NAB with, oh, with sure. Canon, Sony, and Panasonic all pulling out. <laughs> and then there were none. That's NAB right. is canceled. NAB canceled. And if, and if you are at all engaged in this side of the industry, you probably know that already. So we're not going to spend too much time diving into it. But I think it's very telling about uh, big defections causing that the whole show to collapse and it's interesting how some other shows haven't quite done that and when they'll return who knows but yeah there really wasn't a lot of desire yeah. for nab and I, I actually think that there's really not a lot of desire for cinegear right now and uh I, i've heard from a couple of people that they're going because they have to and then i i've also been told that the other people who are going to cinegear maybe are lacking some common sense i, I don't yeah, know i mean it's like i feel like there's a desire to go but just a greater desire to not die yeah so, i think, you know, I think you that's got, pretty got, fair it's, it's it's a and also like if you're uh let's say you're sony you don't want to send your employees into a super spreader event and then they die because they were off showing someone some sexy lens you just came out with nobody wants that yeah, that's not. not but cool. I, I look forward. I look fondly forward to the day that I can go uh, back to NAB. So my real okay. short end. This your week, real short end. Yes, let's get um, to that. <laughs> is it's not a very obscure thing. Apple unveiled the new Apple iPhone 13 Pro Max. Oh yeah. And uh, I watched the whole keynote because they had stuff about the watch and the iPad, and they had you know a bunch a bunch of new uh, products at their keynote. It was it was uh, last week, but I thought it was interesting because the Apple 13 Pro Max they are definitely 
aiming this. It's, it almost reminds me a little bit of a few years ago when Red had a phone. And I remember <laughs> saying, why does Red have a phone? That's weird. You know, I don't want to, you know, use an Alexa to iron my clothes and I don't want to talk on my Red. But uh, it really looks like they're hardcore going after filmmakers. And they had in the keynote, they, they had this uh, short film that they made that was like a whodunit kind of a thing. And I, I mean, no disrespect to the people who made it, but that short did not sell me on this phone. Then they had a thing that was directed by Catherine Bigelow and shot by friend of the show, Greg Frazier. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. Like, it looked amazing. It looked, it looked just amazing. So this new phone, you can get it with up to a terabyte of internal storage. It's got the same three lenses. And I assume the lenses have to not be such great lenses, but they're using insane AI on this thing. The new one can record in ProRes, which is like one of the industry standard formats for editing. And they added a new thing where you can uh, like rack focus on your phone, on your phone camera. The thing that kind of befuddles me a little bit about it is like, let's say I want to go make an, in, an indie feature on my phone, mm. which has been done before. Sure. They, uh, Tangerine was shot on the iPhone 6, I believe. And, and then just a few years ago, Steven Soderbergh made Unsane and he shot that on, I forget which iPhone model. Both of them definitely looked like they were shot on a phone and that was part of the aesthetic that they were going for. So it's not, you know, I'm, it's neither here nor there. But like what they're really going for here is like if, if I'm going to make a movie, I need my phone on set. So I'm going to have to get another phone that like I, I'm unclear about how, uh, the mechanics of all that. I'm sure there's a way to work that out. But I have to say the picture quality was uh, and, and I mean, like when you've got Catherine Bigelow directing a Greg Frazier shooting, it's going to look good. Yeah, ben, I want to interrupt you right now, please. Someone that I know is on Facebook basically saying that what you watched was also partially shot on the Alexa Mini LF. Really? So, and they said, and their attitude was like, oh, does that surprise you? Does that bother you? It wasn't all iPhone 13 That or does whatever. bother me, actually. And, and I, that was my kind of thought, too, especially when someone's trying to do a technology demonstration and then to, to make that claim. And I don't know if they're being sincere or if that is uh, the reality, but it would not be the first time that a... Well, we should tell Greg Frazier to get out of that grading room where he's currently grading <laughs> Dune, the biggest movie of the year, uh, and tell and answer our question. No, I mean, but, uh, but I, I, that would I, surprise me though, that those two people would would associate themselves with something that wasn't uh, on well, the up and up. I don't know if that's not on the up and up, but what it does tell me is that it's something that's been done many times before where uh, the technology used to sell something was not actually the technology that you were buying. And uh, and this goes goes way back to the first time I ever heard about this was a major Japanese DSLR camera manufacturer using a competitor's products to shoot their commercial, showing how awesome and everything was. And then they only showed still photos and all the video stuff was, I know, was another product and, and going back even further though uh i know a company that it was a large japanese company that had the production company take little pieces of tape and cover up the other brand of camera that was being used so that there could be a cognitive dissonance for the uh for the the executives who showed up on set who thought for sure that they must be using the cameras of the company that was interesting commercial. so so it wouldn't surprise me entirely uh if if that's true it is a completely unsubstantiated rumor it is someone who claimed to know on Facebook that that you know it was also shot on on something else and I will tell you that it's seldom all about the camera it really is it has a lot to do with what you're putting in front of the camera and the people behind the camera Always. so so even if you do make something that looks uh it looks incredibly good for a mobile device uh, I I'm going to give a solid caveat emptor out there that there's plenty of other stuff that you can go onto YouTube and look at that does not look like that and I think that um well and this this phone isn't out yet so you can't really uh okay well uh sorry but for all other currently released products, I should yeah. say, uh, I had an executive tell me, oh, uh, we have to shoot everything in at 200 frames per second. So we're not going to use this very, very good camera that that we've already purchased from you. We're going to go out and buy iPhones. And I just went to YouTube and sent them a link to it. I said, OK, here's 200 frames per second on an iPhone. And here's 120 frames per second on the camera that you already own. And you tell me which looks better. And they said, thank you very much. We, 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 we regret that we ever bothered you with this mistake, blah, blah, blah. Oh. So just because a camera 
or a phone can make a good looking image doesn't mean that it always does doesn't mean that it's of entirely course, usable and uh, I will say that uh, in this sort of I think joint uh, now short end from us uh, <laughs> that um, really buyer beware do you make sure that well, you yeah make sure that you're, what I would if say. you're buying it for, they're trying to get more phone sales by making people think oh you know what you can go shoot that movie you want to because it's in your pocket and that's just absolutely a, well, a false I mean, that's a false narrative that they're trying to insinuate and the same way that that other companies have had have tried to in the past um i i agree with a lot of what you're saying and i would always i always would say to somebody if they're thinking about any camera for any project test it just test it you can you can come here to hot rod cameras or basically any camera place ever that that has cameras for sale or rent and you can set up some charts or you can take it outside and shoot it and you can do some tests and you can go to the apple store and you can pull out that new iphone and you can do your own little comparison yeah yeah (laughs) i mean and you know i know the i'm sure the apple uh the iphone 13 pro max is going to be outrageously expensive and especially if you get it with a terabyte of internal storage but i i still think it's interesting that they're doing that and that they're allowing it to record in ProRes and that they're doing all these things that are sort of aimed at professionals. And at the same time, it's hard for me to take away the sting that Apple was the company that took Final Cut Pro 7 and turned it into Final Cut Pro X. So they took a professional tool and turned it into an amateur toy. And, uh, And it took years for it to kind of get back to even partial professional acceptance. But I also have always said, like, if the only tool that you have available to you is a phone and you want to make your movie, make your movie on the phone. You know, like, you know, you, you shouldn't be stopped by technology, especially today, uh, because there are so many uh, options that are relatively inexpensive that where you could make your movie or whatever it is that you're making on on a budget. So I looked it up. It's sixteen hundred dollars for the iPhone uh, 13 with one terabyte. I'm, I'm not going to say that that is uh, more expensive than a uh, a proper maybe mirrorless camera or something like that. But uh, you're getting close. You're getting close yeah. and sort of in the ballpark. And you wouldn't necessarily get a terabyte with the storage with one of those cameras. But uh, certainly there's some very very good used cameras that I would argue are going to be a much better uh, filmmaking experience than having to use the touch screen and the three lenses on the on the iPhone so you know not having used it myself I can though think I speak with a, a good deal of authority that they did not revolutionize the uh, the interface in the way that people uh, are, are working with it and I still think that you're gonna get a better experience from a, a mirrorless camera from a couple of years ago I don't disagree but you also can't text your mother-in-law on any of those mirrorless cameras no but for 29.95 or for free depending on who your provider is you might have another phone <laughs> so certainly a pretty decent Android phone or something else out there that could text your text your mother. Android phone. Yeah, I got one right here. I know it you. Work just fine. I know. Oh, they're awesome. Uh, all right. So so Ben, where can people find you? Where where do you exist uh, outside of this room? I'm uh, just wandering the streets of Sherman Oaks, California. <laughs> uh, you can find me at benrockonline.com, uh, and uh, you can find all my social media uh, links. More and more people keep friending me h- hither and yon on uh, the various sites who uh, tell me that they found me on there. So The LinkedIn's. Th- thank you very much. The, yes, the links in and the... TikTok. <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> I'm not on TikTok. But uh, yeah, so uh, that, that's where you can find me. You can check out my most recent reel, which was edited by a fellow named David Haverty, who I think did an excellent job. And, uh, yeah. How about you, Ilya? Where can people find you? Uh, they can find me here in this dark room at Hot Rod Cameras. Uh, you can find me at hotrodcameras.com and also all the usual social things. But if there's something that you would like to buy or have questions about technology, hit me up. I consider it my civic duty to try to help everyone I can with uh, you know those sorts of questions. I mean, you they... just talked me off the ledge on the iPhone 13 Pro Max. Uh, <laughs> really? Pl- were you, were, you, about to, were no. you about to make the pre-order? I, I really yeah. wasn't. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Ben, who do we have to thank this week? As, as per usual, uh, we should thank Kazal Atrakshi, who uh, is apparently listening to these discussions. And I, I will say that actually during the keynote, Kaze messaged me and said, you know how I make fun of people who shoot movies on the iPhone? Well, maybe I'm wrong now. What? Yeah. <laughs> so. Wow. He was convinced. He watched some slick marketing and said, I'm going to get me well, one of those I got to tell you, the, the Who Done It movie that they showed as a demo of that camera, I watched it and I'm like, are you trying to shoot something? I, I I even tweeted something to the effect of like, it looks like it was shot on the Vericam in like 2003. Like it, it didn't look, it didn't look impressive to me, and it didn't make me go, oh, I want that. And then and then the Vericam like, in 2003 was very impressive. You meant to say for 2003, it was very impressive. That's right. But not by today's standards. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I'm a big Veracam fan. I'm not not trashing in the Veracam. In 2003, it was, I'm saying yeah. if I was trying it, to sell you on something that looked like Veracam circa 2003 today, you gotcha. probably wouldn't be that excited about I'm it. Not that excited. In 2003, today. arguably sexiest camera on the market. Um, it's been a few years. It's yeah. been yeah, yeah yeah. I mean, like entire people have been born and joined the military since yeah, that. 18 years. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Let's thank we, him. We should thank Case uh, because he. He created all the music that you heard on the show today. That's right, he did. And uh, all and, by himself. And we should also thank Ben Katz. Ben Katz, who, who's who's getting like a really, hopefully not too complicated file to cut down from us because uh, we're in the same room. So it, there's nothing to nothing to line up. Nothing too fancy. All right. Well, uh, good luck, Ben. Hope th- hope this works out. And let's thank uh, Alana Cody because you know uh, Alana made this this show happen and made sure that you and I were sitting in this room right now to to do this. Yes, and uh, and she's got me uh, doing two more interviews this week, so she's keeping us real busy. Oh yeah, we got quite a bit in the in the queue right now. So uh, looking forward to it. Should be good. Well, we got Emmy. Well, we just passed Emmy season, but you know it's like we're heading sort of into Oscar movie season here. That's right. It's all coming up really fast here in the in the fall. So uh, we'll we'll watch what's going to happen. Cool. Well, uh, I think that about does it. So thank you very much, and we will see you next week. Uh, Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.